Yeah, so it's a test you're looking for. We don't do tests. We are the first, the last, the nerdum. And I'm Tom, Tom, and I'm here with Mike and... Yes, Boy, sir. have we had a week. <laughs> we had a week indeed. <laughs> yes, we yes, sir, we have. Absolutely, we've had a, a week. I guess oh, it's because this thing is a bit out of I'm been out of shape. Good grief. I was just I was just fussing and <laughs> mussing and fussing with my equipment. Uh as you 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 patiently <laughs> put up with. But yeah, yeah, uh we've had a, a heck of a week. Uh and I mm-hmm. and like Tom said, this is the first last under mom. I'm I'm Mike. And uh, mm-hmm. before we get into uh, the main event here uh, for our weekly. Yeah, yeah, last week we were begging for 100 uh, subscribers, and now we're getting closer to 150. So, hey, we're, yes. uh, we're, we might be doing something right. And our last video is nearing uh, 650 views. So, yeah, that's our, our biggest biggest view yet. Yeah, so I, I, we're... <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, go, go ahead. I interrupted you. <laughs> no, no, no. It's yeah. We're just uh, we're just barreling through. Uh, I like I said. Uh, I'm throwing in the the positive energy for this year, and uh, I think uh, I think it went off with a bang. And uh, hey, I, I you know I, I was I was making it a a personal goal to have this year be the best year for me and uh, for the channel. And uh, yeah, hopefully that positive energy will uh, has started us off, and uh, hopefully it'll go throughout the year <laughs> absolutely yeah we we uh we did that we did that with our special guest uh jay mm-hmm. and we covered yep. uh i think I, I i was a little bit slow in the uptake to remember sometimes it takes the uh the the memory the memory banks a little bit to get jogged and i am getting older all the time as you are uh as <laughs> as everyone else out there is obviously um but uh, i think we had covered uh we had covered at least a few manga uh mm-hmm. for sure and and definitely we're, we're no stranger to anime uh although we are still a little bit more junior on that side but as time goes on i can see that increasing um as we get forward as we go forward and we've already got some really cool stuff next month <laughs> um uh, well and we're, we're both very excited to cover that um so stay tuned for that um but uh yeah um shout out to the to the uh, 70 plus people whatever 60 plus 142 is 60 ish 70 80 ish people <laughs> that uh the to hit the subscribe button you really helped us out so thank you so much we we love mm-hmm. uh we love to see you and as i like i've taken to like to say if you want to see our our content um the uh, the best way to do that is to subscribe so you get a front row seat um and as always we we appreciate the comments and the, and the commentary and feedback as we build this community um this has definitely been a, a lot of hard work on thomas's effort uh to, part my part as well this is a joint thing and it's it's uh, we're not we're not doing this to make money we're never gonna get rich off of this because like <laughs> uh my understanding is that version of youtube is dead and unless you got in like within the first 15 years of youtube and made a name and interesting content you're kind of yeah well you, you you might make your riches some other way or whatever but who knows maybe we'll be like all the other people on on you uh, on <laughs> youtube who uh sells their uh sells t-shirts out of their youtube trunk uh, and, and, and merch as the kids say, but, uh, it, nevertheless, we are very honored and proud to have you join us. No, whether you, you, you find us today or sometime in the not too distant future, uh, we have an ever growing back catalog, as I like to say, uh, and we're, we're about ready to get into our, our main event here, uh, as we continue to uh, find gems, um, mm-hmm. that have u- unique nerd appeal. Um, and I also think that we, we should probably uh, preface our, our, our modus operandi uh by saying that we, i mean it, it's all it's not just anything with a nerd following really i think we broadened our horizons <laughs> and i think we're both very comfortable and at ease with that um but i I'll, we'll get into it with this movie but sometimes movies don't necessarily make a big why you know every movie when it grows up it wants to be the next star wars or jurassic park or something and some movies just don't they, they just don't they just don't uh, make that cut but they do pave the the way for either it's a, a junior title for from a or junior effort from a, a director and maybe they're getting their feet wet they're 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 not quite all the way mature um, you know but all the time things improve but sometimes once in a while a movie comes along um, like this one that uh, be, becomes very f- uh, if this movie had not happened and we'll get into the technical details and and of course that's Dragon Slayer nineteen from nineteen eighty one. Um, if this had not been made, 
the world would look very, very different as far as it goes for Industrial Lights of Magic, uh, you know, all the things that came from that, from all the Star Wars things to all the way out to Jurassic Park even. Um, and we'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll definitely get into there. But this movie is very cool for many reasons. And at first, <laughs> I, I love this because sometimes Thomas and I will have our back and forth. And, uh, you know, like sometimes we'll be well versed and we know each other pretty well. And we'll, we can kind of <laughs> see something coming or like, oh, that makes sense. But and then there's some that are like out of left field like this that I'd never heard of before. And and then you watch it and you can see why people love it and you can appreciate it for the time that it was made in. Uh, and again, uh, and also again, <laughs> this is kind of our, our thing over the last uh, several months. Uh, we're still in the 80s. Uh, we love the 80s. Uh, and, and there's wonderful movies that have cult nerd followings. Um, this is no different. Um, definitely, uh, I, 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 I like my dragon movies and this is uh, this is up there, uh, I got to say. Uh, but with all with my long my long monologue there, what tell us where this came from or why you picked us picked this guy out and 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 maybe give a little background or or you know your two cents uh, and we can go from there. <laughs> yeah, it's um, one of those movies like you uh, said. It's uh, a cult classic because it didn't make money at the off, uh, at the box office. Uh, it came and went pretty quick. Um, yeah, back in that day, nineteen eighty one. Uh, you you had to make a big impression that first week or two at mm-hmm. the box office where you were out of there and then you just kind of disappeared. So uh, that's sort of what happened to this movie. And I think um, at that time, everybody was under the Star Wars fever. They wanted science fiction. They wanted uh, the next big, you know, sci-fi epic. And this kind of took a different route. It went uh, sword and sorcery, went fantasy, and I, I think um, uh, it was maybe mistimed uh, because I, I figure, uh, you know, a few years later when the Star Wars thing had died down a little bit, you mm. know, everybody would be kind of opened up to more of a, you know, a fantasy story, uh, which, you know, basically Star Wars was a fantasy story. Uh, but you had all those big epic battles of uh, spaceships floating around. And this movie, uh, on the surface, all it offered was a dragon <laughs> mm-hmm. and a guy fighting a dragon. And, um, you know, we were wanting epic space battles and we got a dragon, which I think if you sat down and actually watched it, I think word of mouth would have done very well for the movie uh, uh, because uh, it, it got got reviewed very well, uh, even Siskel Niebert. Loved it. So, so I got thumbs up from them. And I, I think, you know, word of mouth would have, but I think there wasn't, um, it didn't stay around in the the theaters long enough to, no. to inspire it. Uh, right. I didn't see it till later on as probably on TV or on videotape. And it was always one of those that I liked, uh, but it never kind of stood out to me. Uh, but uh, recently, uh, um, Paramount released a 4K uh, Blu-ray of it, and I was like, you know what? I need to try that movie again. And I'm glad I did because it's it's a gem. I think you, uh, as a as a kid, you could appreciate all the uh, special effects and all the the coolness. Uh, yep. But as an adult, it actually has a very intelligent story and has uh, well thought out characters that. Uh, don't play like a normal fantasy movie yep. and uh, probably influenced uh, many of people, not only by the special effects, but also uh, by, by its unique storytelling and in, in that it doesn't <laughs> tell a, a story of good versus evil. It tells a story of people uh, trying to do uh, what is right and whatever they think is right. <laughs> Yeah, I, I can appreciate this has more in common with the old classic fairy tale, um, as in there's like a dark, uh, the, the mini message. You can make any movie mm-hmm. say any kind of messaging yeah. you want, or, or or maybe that's the wrong mm-hmm. wording considering nowadays with the message, but all joking aside, um, this is a lot darker in tone, and I believe mm-hmm. this was a joint effort by a Disney mm-hmm. and, and Paramount and mm-hmm. um, if it didn't have that paramount side to it, it would not it would not carry the weight that it carries today. Um, uh, this uh, what I found there was it it was dark, uh, and I love that uh, because it was like a classic um, story, something that is sorely lacking to today's movies. And and I say this again and again. And I don't think I'm unique or original when I say it, but it's still true. 
movies like this in the eighties took a lot more risk. They took a lot more chances. Um, they didn't tell you everything that was going on in the scene, you know, and they, they didn't point out every little thing. They left it to you because, uh, and I, and I saw some, I know, I, I know we, we, we share a love of, of, uh, Twin Peaks and David Lynch, uh, together. Mm-hmm. I, I think you're a little bit more of a super fan than I am. Um, but nonetheless, I, I saw a quote from Lynch that said something like, um, you know, he, 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 he wanted to allow the space for, for, you know, the, 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 I think it was an interview and he was saying something along the lines of like, well, what do you, what do you have to say about this or that? And he goes, you know, I, I don't really have anything to say. I don't really want to say anything. I want my, I want the movie to speak for itself and I want you to go see it and then you talk about it and then how you think or feel about it, you know, that kind of thing. Quentin Tarantino's no different on that front um, for fans um, and, and making movies and not telling you every little detail. There's some mystery left. Um, and this, but anyway, I, I also was talking to another friend, a newer friend, and uh, and I had mentioned this movie, and uh, they, uh-huh. they said something along the lines of like, I, I haven't seen that before, but it really reminds me of like a whole cache of like, you know, nostalgia, you know, like when you were a kid in the uh-huh. 80s, you 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 thought you had these movies that were that stuck with you. Everybody has mm-hmm. it. Like the Secret of Nymph for me, um, mm-hmm. the, the Secret Garden. I think that would that was one. Uh, I might be butchering mm-hmm. that, but there's like a whole bunch of treasures that are you know depending upon how old you are and where you, and what time you grew up in and how old you were when this stuff was going on. This is way before my time. Well, mm-hmm. it wasn't too far behind my time, but it was a minute before. And mm-hmm. but I never saw it in. Um, uh, that's another mm-hmm. thing too is you get the second um the second layer of coolness from this because of uh, uh, uh it's just it's been sitting there and these movies are mm-hmm. all out there and they're just waiting for for discovery and yeah uh, and we're we're not the only ones who bring this we're not we're not the first to, to do this we're not gonna be the last <laughs> um but we yeah. are the nerdum and this is this goes in the this goes right up in the library and i could easily see myself um because i i really enjoyed this um I really, it ticked those boxes for me as a kid. Like, even though I'd never mm-hmm. seen it, it reminded me of so many great memories of seeing these kind of things as a kid um, that I, I did a little bit of light research, but I, I think there's really good 4K cuts of this out in the wild. Um, I didn't do too many, too too much, but I yeah, did yeah. see. Yeah, um, yeah. Last year, they came out with a uh, 4K release, and that's what, okay. what I watched of it, the 4K Blu-ray. Um, yeah, it's it's definitely something to check out uh seeing it uh seeing it uh in 4k in those widescreen um you know if you if all you have ever seen of it, the movie mm-hmm. i know uh, we have a lot of older viewers uh which we love you guys because we were older too absolutely uh, we're of the same mindset but um if you watched it back in the day on videotape and loved it on videotape or on on tv uh you know they cut that down they scan mm-hmm. span you know uh, pan and scanned it so it, you know the 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 sides were cut off to fit the old TVs that were square uh back in the day so you didn't get those wide vistas and beautiful uh landscapes that they shot in they they shot in Ireland and the the Isle of um Sky and it's got so, such beautiful beautiful um scenes and um they they juxtaposed those with the uh, uh, they filmed where they filmed Empire Strikes Back and uh, Pinewood Studios in England, and they mm. had these huge, huge sets uh, that they filmed on. Uh, so uh, none of it was was cheap, and uh, you know a lot of those movies from the '80s did look cheap, and the special effects did look cheap. Uh, but this one uh, really benefits from uh, being restored and put in 4K. And uh, another benefit of the 4K, they have an hour-long documentary um, that interviews uh, Matthew Robbins, who wrote, co-wrote and directed it, uh, plus uh, uh, three of the guys from uh, ILM. Uh, and uh, they kind of went into details of how they uh, made the, the, the dragon work and everything. Plus, on um, the commentary track, you have Matthew Robbins and Guillermo del Toro, <laughs> both both uh, respected directors, uh, kind of going through. And Guillermo uh, loved this movie and loved the dragon. He says it's the best dragon ever captured on film, and that uh, you know it's it's been an inspiration for him. And you know he was talking about 
getting those those magazines like Starlog and uh, Cinefax, which was a huge uh, kind of special effects magazine back in the day. And he said that he would go over and reread it. And he said if you pulled out his old issue, uh, it would have little pieces of clay kind of stuck to it because he had it right next to him as he was sculpting things because uh, that was it was so so influential for him um and um i didn't realize this but um guillermo tapped matthew uh, robbins early in his career he he had him co-write uh his first movie mimic with him oh. and they've also co-wrote uh crimson uh, peak and also his latest movie pinocchio that's out on uh netflix did not know that. The stop cool. at, stop animation. He has stop motion animation one. Yeah, and, and this wasn't and, and uh, was it? Uh, excuse me, Phil uh, uh, Tippett was mm-hmm. uh, was the was the guy who brought this. He pioneered the, this this thing called go motion, and and basically it's mm-hmm. like stop motion ask but with blur uh with motion blur yep um and there, there i'm sure there's a little bit but that's the high points um but it it, it, it ages very well uh is the point mm-hmm. which is why you would want to see a really ultra high uh, high quality 4k edition of this um and of course i, I unfortunately I, w- I was locked into what i could get uh at the time mm-hmm. um but um that will change because this is a movie that i do want to see on a really big screen in really good quality and enjoy it, you know, um, mm-hmm. when, when all when all things are equal. This is a great movie to share with your kiddos. Um, mm-hmm. You know, maybe age a little bit, but, you know, you probably don't want to show it to a three-year-old. Um, yeah. But, you know, <laughs> uh, it, it's it's it, it, it has some scenes. It's not um, over-the-top mm-hmm. gory, but it's very real. Um, mm-hmm. And this is not the soft, cuddly, puff the magic dragon, you know, cartoony, yeah. animated, <laughs> friendly dragon. This is, like, serious business. This is, which I like, I like, like you were saying about fantasy, it, it does some things with fantasy a little bit different, um, but it doesn't hide anything. Uh, and I, I like that mm-hmm. it's serious fantasy from the standpoint of it, this is a like I said, it's a little bit darker, uh, and it's for a reason. <laughs> you know, it's to build yeah. that, build that. Yeah, I think up. I think that the DNA of this movie helped uh, write the DNA for uh, Game of Thrones. I think. Um, yeah, it's it gave uh, fantasy a bit more mm-hmm. maturity, uh, a little bit more uh, life to it. Um, Matthew Robbins, uh, he's um, he was one of those film school students that uh, were around uh, and went to film school with George Lucas and that that crowd. So right. he he kind of had uh, some some of those same friendships, and that kind of led him to ILM. Uh, but I, I know we will talk a little bit more about the dragon and all of that stuff. But to kind of build on the the story first, uh, obviously the story is about a, you know a young apprentice that has been uh, left alone by his uh, a sorcerer, um, uh, which uh, yeah, death death by a, a castle a castle guard. Or something. Mm. <laughs> it seems like you know the it seems like uh, the sorcerer kind of let let a guard kill him. Uh, but then, uh, so the um, sorcerer apprentice has to take over and and face the dragon. And uh, but the story, uh, he was uh, Matthew Robbins wasn't really big into fantasy <laughs> until one of his friends kind of pushed uh, Lord of the Rings <clears throat> into his hands. It's like read this book, <laughs> and so he Excuse read me. it, and he was so enthralled with it. Him and his um, <clears throat> co-writer for this uh which is uh what was his name uh how uh the how, he, he, they co-wrote a lot of stuff together uh writers uh, how uh, barwood uh and how Matthew barwood Robbins, yep. uh but both of them uh wrote wrote the screenplay and it was uh, a spec script so they uh, w- which what that means is um you know a studio didn't ask for the script they just kind of wrote it on their own hoping that a studio would pick it up and i think it was something in the water at that time because um you had a bunch of people playing dungeons and dragons a lot Mm. of people reading lord of the rings at the time you know it never went out of fashion to read lord of the rings i think Mm -hmm. i read it in high school i think a lot of people (laughs) no matter what what decade they they grew up they they read that book uh, but, uh, but yeah, so at that time, Dungeons and Dragons was getting very big and a lot of the studios wanted a dragon movie mm-hmm. and just so happened <laughs> that script was there and both Paramount and Disney wanted it. And they decided instead of 
fighting over it, they decided to work together and make that movie. So even though it doesn't play like a Disney movie, this is very much a Disney movie. And at the time, Disney was being very adventurous and kind of on the edge and doing a lot less animation and, and facing and focusing more on live action like Dragon Slayer and mm-hmm. Tron. Uh, Tron was another thing. Uh, but but both the Dragon Slayer and Tron kind of kind of nosedived at the box office, so um, that they they may be the reason why Disney kind of backed off and focused more back on to animation and uh, the more safer bets, uh, so to speak. Uh, which you know we can uh, talk about all day whether or not you know if these movies had made it big, you know what direction Disney would have went in. Uh, but I think um, no matter what. Um, how off center Disney gets, it always kind of realigns back into um, that track of, of family uh, oriented material. So, you know, whatever whatever your opinion of Disney is right now, it's probably going to self correct and <laughs> get back in line with uh, whatever their uh, their core values are. Um, but yeah, so so this movie and also Matthew Robbins was very focused on um, the the characters. He, he before he went to film school, he was kind of a, 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 lit- a literary major, um, so he had those um, mm. classic right. stories that in his mind, mm. uh, and story sure. was the focus for him. Uh, in fact, when he was writing the script, he said the actual writing of the script was really quick and easy because what him and Hal kind of focused on before they actually put pen to paper was all of the characters and their motivations, and they worked out who those characters were and how they would interact. And so once they understood the characters and who they were, writing the script was very easy because um, they knew the, the the characters front and back and it went, went through very quickly. Yeah, th- it, this was very well put together. You could tell somebody knew how to write. Um, and that is unique to a writer-director versus like just a generic mm-hmm. director that'll take, you know, whatever. Movie. And I'm not saying that besmirching, you know, directors who are different than that, but... There is something to be said for a writer director and, and the quality of the because mm-hmm. they have to take every single time they they go to a new project, they start over all the way from scratch. You know, they might mm-hmm. bring the art with them forward a little bit, but they got to start all over again. Uh, mm-hmm. And if you could imagine doing that, you know, one time that's amazing, and then uh, you to go on to do that ten times, you know, maybe uh, 15, 20 mm-hmm. times. You know, it probably gets a little bit easier as you as you do it. Maybe I don't know. I've never done mm-hmm. it. I probably never will. Never will do it. Let's be honest. Mm-hmm. Um, but all the same, uh, hats off. Th- this, I'm just. I wonder. I guess maybe it was just timing uh, because you, this had all the hallmarks. It was people liked it, uh, the critics liked it, but I, it just didn't. It just didn't quite catch the fire. Yeah. Maybe. Th- 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 who knows? Like when you get into speculation, it, it, speculation is fiction right off the bat. But. Maybe if it was a month before, maybe if it was six months later, who knows? Uh, this could have, you know, caught on uh, with that because yeah. it had all the classic hallmarks of the things that were popular at that time that are always, to be honest with you, never go out of style. You, you know, you always have. How, it's a trope for crying out loud. Uh, at, at well, this I think. Day and age. I think um, you know the 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 target audience was obviously kids. I think. Um, Kids were more geared towards. They wanted the next Star Wars. They wanted mm. the big space battles. Um, they weren't ready for a, a fantasy at that point. They were still kind of because uh, Empire Strikes Back had just come out. You know, they wanted mm. all those epic, epic space battles, and all this offered was a dragon. So, <laughs> it was like, I think, I think, uh, yeah, if it would came out a, a few years later, uh, when like Conan was uh, came mm. out, when when did Conan come out? I forget. Uh, but yeah, I think if it had kind of, let's see, let me see. Yeah, that was you, 82, 82, 82. Okay, yeah. So that it's probably, right. probably off, off by a year. You know, if it had came out like a year or two later, I think it would have, uh, done very well. Uh, but yeah, it's just one of those things is like you said, it's, it's kind of timing. And then, um, and also the, the characters are very interesting. They're very real. Uh, Matthew Robbins uh, said that, you know, uh, a movie does need kind of, especially fantasy, needs that fantastical element to it. But his his feeling on fantasy is um, not everything should be, you know, the whole world shouldn't be filled with um, 
uh, fantastical elements, a, a bunch of magic, because then it dilutes the power of that magic. And he wanted to root it into real life that, you know, these are people with real struggles, uh, with mm. real life uh, problems. And here's this, this uh, super magical dragon. And then it's also at the tail end of uh, uh, the realm of magic. You know, the, these are the last sorcerer and the last dragon kind of coming to the coming to the end of the the big magic uh and the the push for Christianity and um you know the faith and that kind of uh, kind of pushes out all this uh wild magic that uh that was there at the time so it's um in the the way they handle it like you know the the hero of the story he can almost kind of debate over whether or not it's um you know, uh, John um, or Peter McNichols, who plays Gallen, or is it uh, Valerian Caitlin Clark, uh, the female <laughs> protagonist mm -hmm. in the movie? Uh, both are very strong and uh, kind of have both have that leadership uh, quality to them. And Gallen, you know, he's he's not the perfect uh, perfect hero. You know, mm -hmm. he starts off, um, you know, the uh, you know wide eyed apprentice. He gets his power, or or thinks he gets this power, and he comes becomes this kind of blustering kind of you know show off, uh, like yeah I I could slay your dragon, and he you know he has a bit of a comeuppance later in the movie where he realizes maybe he's not all he's cracked up to be, and then uh, Valerian starts off you know um, cross dressing as a boy so she doesn't get picked in the lottery of uh, you know virgin women. Right. Um, so she's had to go through her own adversity and um, kind of comes through and shines in her own right. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, there's like the sense yeah. of, yeah, exactly. There's this uh, sense of uh, realness to the characters. They're both, they both have their strengths and weaknesses. No one stands out as a, a true hero. Even the, the Sorcerer Supreme at the beginning of the movie you know, he, he said there's an odd, you know, kind of odd comment where he says, you know, um, this other sorcerer, he could turn uh, lead into gold. I could never do that. You know, it was, <laughs> there's, he kind of had this kind of blue collar kind of uh, feeling to him. You know, he was, uh, you know, he wasn't talking, you know, in these, you know, <laughs> grand English uh, accent with, the, you know, the, the and thou. Yeah. <laughs> kind right. of going high around. Born. High born would be yeah, a better, better, better right. way to put it. Highbrow, high right. born. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He's, he, uh, so yeah, there's this, this, this sort of blue co uh, collar kind of relationship. So wherever you get to like uh, the royal class, <laughs> and they and they, they kind of have their pomp and circumstance. Um, you can see the artificiality to that. Um, but yeah, also shout out to uh, Ralph, Sir Ralph Richardson, who played Ulrich the uh, Sorcerer. He really adds, you know, he he could have been played much more like Gandalf, kind of stoic and. Um, you know, all powerful, but you know, uh, Richardson gives this sort of a uh, quirky kind of you know, uh, odd sort of humorous slant to him. Here we go. Uh, but but yeah, he always ha he has that presence, but then he's also very humorous as well. <laughs> and uh, the play between him and Gallen are, are, are really uh, really unique. And uh, yeah. Ralph, uh, Sir Ralph Richardson was a friend of Alec Guinness. And uh, you know, famously, Al Guinness is a uh, Obi Wan Kenobi, and uh, I think um, one of the reasons why Richardson took this role was because he was kind of kind of um, mystified of how you know these these new filmmakers are making these crazy <laughs> sci fi and fantasy movies, and you know, Alec, his friend Alec, did it, and he was kind of curious, you know, if if he should do it as well. And um, Matthew Robbins said while they were filming, <laughs> uh, Richardson really kind of pushed him a little bit, uh, kind of test him to see if he was actually a real filmmaker. And he said that they they uh, ended up having a really good friendship, and that That's um, awesome. that yeah, it was um, he learned they they both learned a lot from each other. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say too uh, while we, we were uh, um, going through the cast here. Uh, Emperor Palpatine, uh, Ian Mc, uh, mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> Ian was uh, it was in this as well. 
uh, very early on. And uh, boy, he looks like a young man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, with the fuzzy hair. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, the, yeah. so th th this is kind of the cool thing that happens with movies. And, and I don't have any story to tell or, or any background, but it's kind of funny to see um, different actors and cast members and special, fa you know, all the uh, everyone from the director on all the way through, they kind of rotate through the same circles and they, they, they make appearance. And then lo and behold, you know it, they, they're there and they make, uh, you know, they, they have these roles that will forever live on in our memory. Um, and that just is not, it's not the same. I mean, it, it's a little bit different world today. Obviously, I don't want to say it's better or worse, but it's completely different. Um, but that that's something to note, too. Um, as, like I said, this is foundational, <clears throat> as me and Tom's kind of sort of alluded to at the, at the top of the show. And, and uh, this this go motion this this uh, ILM you know uh, I, I I did read a little bit of history that said something like um, for a little bit Steven Spielberg was like looking about whether he wanted to use computer CGI or if he wanted to you know what what he was going to do for Jurassic Park and uh, go motion was was one of the things I think he was thinking about entertaining um, but can you imagine a world where Jurassic Park would have been made like that, um, you know, would it have held up? Would it would have what would have been? Of course, they did the CGI very well. And I remember, um, I think it was the 20th, some odd anniversary of it, they released Jurassic Park in theaters. And I remember seeing it much older, much wiser. Mm -hmm. uh, and I still, I still was, uh, it, it is, you can't be going to a movie theater, although you can get pretty damn close nowadays, let's be honest. Um, but, but to, to be in the theater and to, to relive it is something special. Um, and, uh, with that, uh, just a little quick side note, January 24th, and I'll put the link in the description. It is only a couple more days left if you can get it. Um, but they're re-releasing Dune part one for one night only, Ju uh, January 25th, or excuse me, January 24th, um, uh, the Wednesday in a couple days, um, where it, they'll re-release it and it'll be like to, to the IMAX, the IMAX, the really good, nice version. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's out there too, but I'll put that in there. Just a little shout out to our Dune, a uh, little, mm -hmm. little back history with their channel and, and, mm -hmm. and Dune part one, 2021. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> I digress. Yeah, I, this is no different. This is very iconic yeah, yeah, for, yeah, for the, other reasons. Yeah. Yeah, and as I watched it uh, again, I, I didn't know the pedigree of ILM doing this, so I was continuously blown away this time by uh, by the special effects. And uh, watching the documentary, and, and then uh, while I watched it, I was like, ILM did this. I, I could tell ILM, you know, it has the stamp of ILM on it. And then as the credits roll, I saw that. I was like, oh, yeah, okay, that makes sense. And then, of course, the documentary spends a lot of time on um, the special effects of this movie because – Obviously, the dragon is the star of the movie, uh, but uh, but yeah, they uh, as as um, Mike said, Phil Tippett he did the um, the the go animation of uh, the dragon in the cave. Uh, Ken Ralston did the flying uh, dragon, and there you can tell tell that um, you know there's a sharp contrast uh, just because um, you know the the dragon is is portrayed and and they speak of him as a an older spiteful dragon um so the you know when he's walking on the ground in those cave that cave you know he's hiding in the cave for protection but it's kind of a cramp uh and you could tell that w the way he walks um but yeah in ILM they you know in 1980 80 uh, I, I was I think is when they actually started filming this yeah, you know, that was before Empire had came out, and mm. you know ILM was thinking. You know, they weren't thinking. You know, well, obviously they were. You know, George Lucas started the company, and um, but they were kind of thinking. You know, where where do we go from here? Because uh, Empire's coming out. Um, you know, is George Lucas going to do a third movie? Mm. You know, there was a, there was no idea. You know, maybe Star Wars was a flash in the pan, and Empire Strikes Back would bomb. You know, there, there was a distinct possibility you know Absolutely. at that time everything is you know, you know looking from with today's eyes you know we can see you know ilm's this huge company but at that time you know they they weren't they you know they they were looking for their next thing and what what do they do as a company mm -hmm. and so when matthew robbins came to them with the idea of applying the 
uh, special effects that they did for Empire Strikes Back onto a fantasy story of drag, and they were very much interested and kind of jumped at the chance uh, to do that. And obviously that led to them doing Raiders of the Lost Ark, you know, and E.T. and all mm-hmm. of those uh, future movies. Uh, and they've become this huge, uh, you know, uh, company that makes special effects and are, are widely respected. Uh, but yeah, this they applied their know-how to this. And like you said, they, they, they did, uh, they created that, that go motion, uh, which, you know, with stop animation, you have, you know, no matter how good stop animation is, when you watch it, you see, you know, there's that minute change from frame to frame. So there's kind of that jerky motion of the, of uh, the animation. Whereas Goma animation, like Mike said, that there's kind of a blur effect. Mm-hmm. Um, Cause when you're walking, there is this sort of a blur, a natural blur to things. Um, <clears throat> so they, they were able to do it. I forget how exactly with the right. emulsion and the, the time lapse and the film and all of that, but they can give um, that, that, um, creature that's not moving uh, a, a sense of uh, movability as they kind of minutely change it, uh, but then give it kind of that blur effect. Um, but yeah, so so Phil Tippett and Ken Ralston they they um, were the masterminds behind that, and obviously it takes you know uh, a lot of time to animate those. And um, you know, it, it, I think you know if you just go in and you know, kind of wham, bam, you could kind of do use the tools that they did, but badly, you know, with bad special effects, you could tell what's bad about it. Uh, with great special effects, you know, you no longer really watch the special <clears throat> effects. You just kind of uh, dial into it. But you, you, you are know, you are there with the character, with your hero, with your with your with a villain or whatever you're feeling it. You know, you, you, you get drawn yeah. in as you do uh-huh. for any good. Any of this thing, mm-hmm. absolutely, go continue. <laughs> You're right, right on the mark. Right, yeah. on the mark. <laughs> right. and uh, one of the things that Matthew Robbins didn't want, he didn't want the dragon to have four limbs and then uh, wings, you know, because uh, he said that they always look kind of odd. Uh, they looked a little off when mm-hmm. you had, you know, the four, you know, the, the front, front arms and then wings. Um, so he wanted it more like a bat. Uh, and that's very much the way they did it. They studied the bone structure for bats. Um, and you could tell uh, when that creature, that dragon's walking around on on its wings, you know, its, its arms are attached to the wings. It's walking around like, you know, a bat would walk around. And that, uh, that attention to detail, and they really brought it to life. Um, that dragon really feels real um, so that, you know, I think obviously this dragon has influenced the dragons <laughs> uh, oh. for all dragons dragon uh, heart. up yep. into the future. Yeah, it's yep. uh, lots. You know the <laughs> yeah um, that movie a few years back, Reign of Fire yep, that, that had one. dragons in it. Um, they the world their one. goal yep. <laughs> their goal was to do a modern version of of the the dragon from this movie. Uh, but yeah, and also <laughs> as a nod to this movie. Uh, in one of the episodes of Game of Thrones, uh, when the uh, they were talking about uh, previous dragons, uh, this dragon's name was mentioned. I, I think you're good with pronouncing that that dragon name, but <laughs> I always forget how. Yeah, I'll try it. I'll try it here in a minute when I get the uh, when I get the thing. I, I uh, it was uh, Vitamax or something like. That. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, yeah, I was joking. Yeah, I, I was joking. I was like, yeah, it sounds like some kind of antibiotic or something, it's like Zithromax or whatever. It's that's not it. But uh, give me a minute and, and, yeah. uh, and I'll. I, I don't want to. I don't want to. I don't want to butcher it. Uh, I want to give it the yeah, respect but it, that it, it comes, deserves. But go on, yeah, go ahead. It it, it comes from Latin uh, as well, but yeah, you gotta look that up. But yeah, it's um a, a lot of iconic stuff. And when I was saying that um kind of this this uh, movie has kind of the DNA that Game of Thrones does. I mean, <clears throat> it it breaks some Myth of the Rex. rules of yeah. it. Yeah, it it kind of what was it again? Uh, uh Vermith Rex. <clears throat> yeah. Um, but yeah, it kind of breaks, uh, the mold of fantasy, you know, fantasy, you have the, the fair maiden, the princess, uh, the hero saves the princess. And in fact, this movie, uh, print, the princess doesn't end up too well. <laughs> and uh, there's a lot of things in it, like Mike said, that turns it a lot darker 
And I think the the darker nature may have kind of turned people off um, to this movie uh, originally because they they wanted a traditional fantasy. And uh, yeah, this is a Disney movie, one of the very rare Disney movie that has uh, nudity oh, in it as well. And yeah, um, yeah, yeah, the, it's, it's a very serious, uh, very. Uh, I don't even know it was rated. I would, I don't think it was PG thirteen. It was, uh, was PG. It? Uh, it was PG because okay. uh, there wasn't a PG thirteen at that time. Uh, there wasn't. Um, that, I forget history? what. <laughs> I forget what movie caused the the PG thirteen. Um, but but yeah, it, <laughs> but yeah. So a lot of movies, uh, some that would probably um, should have leaned towards R, but they they kind of kept it as PG uh, just so that it could uh, appeal to the you know so that the younger audience could get into it. Um, but yeah, oh this is one of the more harder PG uh, movies, and uh, yeah, the Matthew Robbins said that he didn't know it at the time, but um, a friend of his said that if um, they, if they weren't off in in England making this movie uh, out of the watchful eyes of Disney, those scenes would never have uh, oh, been no. filmed <laughs> or never. would never have. Uh, yeah, they said uh, yeah if they were back in. Uh, yeah. America, where uh, Disney could have been watching them, and, they they would have cut those out of the gate. <laughs> and, and that is true to 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 this day. Uh, people people think that uh, uh, and I'm, I'm not going to get into it too much, but you know they had Echo uh, not too long ago come come out uh, this past uh, last couple weeks or so, and uh, that's supposed to be the edgy, you know, kind of Netflix Daredevil type. A Disney's Disney Plus version of it, and whether you like it or not, or it's good or bad, whatever. But uh, uh, you know, that's why they had. That's why Disney famously had Miramax, so they could do more adult kind of things. It was all still kind of mm-hmm. the same company, but it didn't because Disney, the Disney name brand, is something very serious that they held to the chest. They they had they for crying out loud, they created their own friggin' market force for it for the Disney Vault and all this. Um, you know, in the special special version mm-hmm. and and whatnot. So they they had their own legendary status. So this would be very tough to make uh, with the Disney anything next to it. it would it wouldn't mm-hmm. happen. Uh, so it's very very rare, which adds to the the whole uh, mythos of this, so to speak, with the, the content and and how they did things. Um, that's why that's why I like this this movie. It's it's very serious. It it, it there's death. It it, it it we kind of like it, we have very kind of bubble wrap uh kind of movies in, in some respects to kiddos nowadays. I'm not mm-hmm. not not saying it's all like that. I'm not I'm not saying oh back in the old days or the old golden days were better. N- not necessarily saying that. Mm-hmm. But how when was the last time you saw a death on camera on on camera or any kind of gore? You know, obviously age appropriate to the to the time. That had Disney anything, mm-hmm. or or for that matter, like Universal. It it it, it happens, but not really. Um, mm-hmm. You know, you, you kind of got you you kind of got your hero and 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 the hero's crew, and they kind of got plot armor around them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's a little bit more um, Fisher Price, I guess. Uh, a little bit, a yeah. little bit different storytelling, movie making, a different, completely right. different thing. But th- this <clears> is why this is kind of like. You know, this is the norm back in the mm-hmm. 80s. I mean, th- this certainly did a unique thing in in, in uh, fantasy and dragons and became the prototype dragon that you would see for the next 40, 50 years, probably even beyond that. Uh-huh. Um, probably way, way when we're 80, 90, um, you, you're, mm-hmm. it's going to be influencing that uh, that that thing still. Yeah, but and... I, I just wish films would have a little bit a more real... I, I mean, obviously it's fantasy, but it has a more mm-hmm. realistic edge to it. Uh, you know, the, mm-hmm. if you're a maiden... There's a little bit of uh, of uh, Hunger Games, a little bit, you know, like all right, uh, you're you're it's your turn um, to uh, to be sacrificed uh, unto the dragon. <laughs> right. Yeah, and I I think um, yeah we tend to kind of bubble wrap children uh, at this <laughs> sort of point, kind of keep them away from from danger. But you know, movies are a safe way to experience that that danger, mm-hmm. um, and and for kids to learn lessons, like obviously. Back in the day, uh, the Grimm's fairy tales and those fairy tales of mm-hmm. yesteryear was much more darker. It was basically much telling so. you, yeah, if you go off in the woods alone, you're going to end up dead. <laughs> you, or you're going to you, you're going to be eaten yeah. by the old witch yeah. in the in the in the cabin or whatever. <laughs> 
Right, yeah. Most of them, you end up dead, you know. <laughs> that that cool thing you could probably do, you know, the the wolf's probably going to eat you. Um, so, yeah, in, um, you know, in, in the, I think a lot of, like you said, the back in the 60s and 70s, a lot of the children's programming <laughs> kind of had that mentality of, hey, you know, um, <laughs> it kind of had a, had an edge to it. And I, I enjoyed that because kids are naturally kind of drawn to it. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, but they don't want to be overloaded. They don't want to be kind of shocked and traumatized. Mm-hmm. So if you could kind of give a little bit in, um, yes, <laughs> there's an argument to be made whether or not some of the stuff from the seventies kind of pushed the line. Uh, but I think a lot of the stuff from the eighties kind of, kind of started softening the edges of those things, but they still had, uh, some of the harder edges uh, still it, baked into it, and I think um, yeah, this this was kind of an interesting movie in that yeah, there's there's some uh, some gore in this movie, and, and like I said, some nudity. And I, I looked it up. Um, the it wasn't the first movie, but Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom caused a bunch mm. of controversy because it was PG, and uh, people really said that it probably should have been R. So. Uh, they started talking about doing a PG-13 uh, rating, and the first movie that was PG-13 was Red Dawn. <laughs> it was one of those that uh, was was kind of a big movie, but um, but wasn't completely on my radar. Uh, but yeah, so so this movie, and I also liked uh, Peter McNichol. I, I think he's. Uh, they said that uh, he doesn't uh, like this movie. He mm. doesn't like his portrayal in it. But I think he's a very reminiscent of a of a young Mark Hamill. He's kind of got that that presence to him, that that boyish charm that kind of works well at the beginning of the movie as the apprentice, mm-hmm. and um, he's able to to turn a switch later on in the movie. And after he's gone through some uh, 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 trials and tribulations, he he becomes more of a man, and he has a he he is able to give that presence to himself. Um, that that makes you believe that he's kind of had this uh, growth as a as a person. Um, so you know, shout out to him and uh, <laughs> Peter McNichols. I I know him best because I used to watch the show Ally McBeal, and he was uh, oh, okay uh, yeah. one of the, the the characters on on that show. And uh, he he kind of made his mark uh, with that. I think kind of came into his own. Uh, but yeah, a, a funny story about Peter McNichol. I read in on on Wikipedia. They said that. Uh, this casting agent had went to see him see a play that he did in Minneapolis, and she told him, "Hey, you know, you know, you you'd make it big in New York, uh, you know, if you if you move there, and you know, and and to look me up." And so he he did move to New York, and he went to see her and, and in her office and said, "Hey, I'm here." And do you have anything? And she goes, Yeah, I think I do. And it was they were auditioning for Gallon for Dragon Slayer. Okay. So he 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 became a front runner. So so his first day in New York, he gets uh, you know gets um you know almost you know gets casted the this big huge movie, and he's off uh, off his on his way to England. So yeah, it's uh, kind of kind of worked out for him, sort of. Um, yeah, and they have some of the screen tests that he did, and um, they, I guess they had two different uh, uh, female actresses to play uh, Valorant, mm-hmm. and they, um, they they had the screen tests for uh, Caitlin Clark, who uh, became Valorant, and another actress, I forget her name. Uh, but yeah, from the two, they they made the the best decision. She did a, a wonderful job oh, in the role. <laughs> she she stole all the scenes that she was in, uh, especially opposite of uh, of the main character of Peter, uh-huh. um, his character. <clears throat> yeah, th- this this is another thing too. Oh oh, that's the other thing too. I wanted to say there there is a chemistry there is a chemistry there between uh, between Peter and and Caitlin. Um, you uh-huh. you can pick up on that is very. Yeah. It's very wholesome and enduring and it, it, it just draws you even more in. It's kind of like uh, you know, yeah. uh you you get to see two individuals on screen. It's kind of like um the office, like Jim and Pam, mm-hmm. that they they uh they milk the hell out of that for, for years. Yep. Uh, or uh, Winnie and Kevin, you know, uh, these, these mm-hmm. kind of like um wholesome kind of you know, there's something there and you you the audience the more it goes on the more you see them the more you want that to happen you know the more you, mm-hmm. you again this is something that modern films they lose track of sometimes um and to be fair like i said many 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 times the vast majority of anything that comes out in any given year 
is either Drac or just okay. <laughs> you, mm-hmm. you might get a little bit of a might rise up to good, but the, the, the to rise up to the top is very rare. Um, and it's a shame that this didn't become more of a of a of a hit, as it were. But um, all the same, yeah. I'm, su- I'm, su- I'm really surprised that they haven't gone back and like, uh, you know, resurrected its corpse and like made some god awful, you know, th- maybe they have. I, I don't <laughs> remake. Know. Who knows? Maybe no, they it, have, but... yeah, they they haven't they haven't remade it yet. But yeah, I, I think they would soften all the edges <laughs> to it. Like, um, there's the, the right. scene. There's the right. scene early on where you know, uh, like we said, the they were uh, they they sacrifice a, a virgin ever. I think they said five years um, to the dragon to uh, so the dragon doesn't destroy the uh the the kingdom right um so so they um so they have a lottery every year and um i didn't i didn't think about this but um guillermo talked about it he said that's very political and i was like Mm. what and but he was talking about with matthew robbins and matthew robbins is you know a few um few generations uh before me and he went through yeah, I was just a, a baby at the time, but he was going through uh, the possibility of being drafted into Vietnam, mm. and that's sort of a, a lottery as well with with men true. Um, getting picked uh, from this, you know, uh, you know, from you know, from the from the government uh, with this instead of the the kingdom. But yeah, there's there's parallels there, and uh, you know that that dread and um, you know having um your future dictated uh for you and um that it that you know uh, more likely it could end up in death uh mm-hmm. was very much a, a thing on his mind so uh the thought of um you know a lottery like that um very much real and so yeah it gives that gravity towards this uh that wasn't wouldn't have been there if um you know someone hadn't kind of gone through that uh there's kind of this weightiness to it and in that scene where that uh that young virgin was being sacrificed it feels very real um there's you know she's kind of cuffed to it and she actually gets herself um free of those cuffs but in the process you know she you, she's scraping her skin and mm-hmm. she's bleeding all over very herself it's, right. yeah very visceral and um what matthew robbins had wanted to do uh, in that scene is have the dragon kind of play with her after she gets free is kind of kind of bat her around and kind of keep her you know keep her uh in line and then kind of playing with his food before he uh roasts her <laughs> right. and um they built this you know a uh, huge uh leg and tail and to uh work with that scene and it was supposed to have these armatures that moved moved around and you know Paramount and Disney kind of flew that giant pieces over uh, to England, and when it got to them, uh, they didn't work. Um, and right. so uh, it, it never crossed Matthew Robbins's mind that, <laughs> that this you know this huge company at Disney would send over equipment that did not work, <laughs> that <laughs> that they couldn't couldn't use the way they wanted to. And so on the fly, he said, you know, they weren't like making a student film to make it work on the day of the shooting, but that's what they were doing. Um, he was like, okay, well, uh, maybe we could have the tail just kind of flop down, you know, <laughs> like like with force. And so all of those scenes are kind of improvised. And, funny. And, and gosh darn it, they work. I mean, it doesn't, doesn't and, convey what he wanted, but it does. It is effective, and, and and that is something that you will never get with computer animated anything. It is that because all that mm-hmm. stuff was practical effects. That the um, the the I guess the more human size um, mm-hmm. models that they made, not the miniatures, not the big one, you know. That but they they made it very intricately detailed, so that the actors could have could be could do their job more effectively, and convey that. And and this is very visceral. This is like the, I think at one point. And this is a you know, you know forty uh, you know forty plus year old movie, so we're not we're not really spoiling it either. But at the same time, you know, uh, you, you had a, a princess uh, get her leg ate off by the dragon babies. <laughs> yeah. You know, when are you yeah. gonna? You're never gonna see that. 
Are you kidding me? You know, I, I mean, it's a Disney movie. <laughs> yeah. Well, and the, the other funny thing, well, and the other funny thing that goes in this favor is, is that uh, you know, the, the very visceral, very real. There's a hard, realistic edge to this that is kind of scary, that is kind of frightening, mm-hmm. uh, and I think that it just goes. It just goes to show, like if they if they you take a, a chance and and step out again, this movie made cinema history for different reasons. It didn't become a smash hit. Mm-hmm. It, you know, we don't all have lunch boxes with the Dragon Slayer. You know, and Dragon Slayer <laughs> right. two and three and four. You know, whatever. I'm making it up, yeah, but yeah. like at the same time, you watch plenty of these movies, and I and I watch plenty of these movies. And actually, we had a little private discussion about this a little bit about kind of different movies we saw and how old we were. You know, in our private chat, and uh, you know, none of us grew up to be serial killers. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, uh, don't, uh, don't, don't, don't get it twisted. Uh, modern, modern, uh, modern audiences, which there's no such thing. Um, but that's a whole other story. But anyway. Yeah. I like, I like the, the the dragon babies are very, (laughs) very off putting and and nightmare fuel. Yeah. Nightmare fuel. They're kind of. They're they kind of like uh, pug, you know, sort of pug dogs, sort of. Uh, they they yeah. almost have a dog like uh, ugly. nature ugly. to ugly. them. Yeah, <laughs> very ugly. And that was very much Matthew Robbins's focus. He was like, okay, so so our heroes gonna have to kill these things. Uh, they can't be cute. I can't have cute <laughs> <laughs> dragon babies. Right. And so <laughs> so when that, he was uh, getting the designs for them. Um, you know, the tendency if they're babies, you give them big eyes, and he's like, No, no, no big eyes, no cute. And so that's why he had them kind of, um, they, they made them kind of squinty eyes, right. and yeah, you know, made them very, very ugly looking. And when, in fact, when they they took them to him, I, I think <clears> Bill <throat> Tippett um showed him the, the babies, he 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 took the baby, and it was like, I'm not cute, <laughs> I'm not cute. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it, it also, um, uh, if there's a, like a, fa- a famous scenes like for alien aliens, where you have this this kind of viscera, like this this drooling over uh, the you know alien, and, and it's like kind of stalking the you know it's going about to kill, and it has like this just disgusting you know kind of thing, and stripping everywhere, and it's getting all you know it's just like you can feel the pain <laughs> of what's about to happen with those babies. Yep crone all over you you can't do a damn thing about it uh and, and just not like a nightmare fuel <laughs> so <laughs> absolutely i have no yeah, doubt that that uh lit, lit many uh, childhood uh, uh nightmares uh for many many decades <laughs> right and one of the things with those those babies and also they they did three versions of the dragon they did the stop animation one that was kind of a smaller scale um and you know they made the huge scale one that I think there was a head piece, okay. a leg piece, right. and right. Um, but yeah, and a tail piece, uh, and those were huge. And actually, um, Phil said that he went out drinking with his with the guys at I- ILM <laughs> uh, one night, and they they really tied one on, and then. <laughs> They came back to the uh, ILM studios in England, and there was Matthew Robbins and uh, I think another guy there. They were like, "We're we're here to see the uh, <laughs> the big pieces." And um, Bill goes, I- "I'm out, I'm out, uh, I'm not operating these huge <laughs> pieces of machinery." Drunk, I mean, yeah, no kidding. <laughs> that's that, that's not gonna that's not gonna work. So you let, let the other guys deal with it. Uh, but but they had the big pieces, they had the the small uh, miniature. And then they add uh, a hand puppet uh, for the head. I saw and that in I different think, uh, sh- uh, shot yeah, sales that I was yeah, researching I Chris, the film. Yeah, Chris Weir. Um, I forget. His, uh, I think it's Chris Weir. He um, he was the hand puppet, and um, any of the the hero shots of the dragon, like when he rises up out of the water and you see his head, mm-hmm. um, that was in the close up. That it was so so detailed that you could do close ups, and whenever um, you know the the dragon finds its it's dead babies and kind of nuzzles one um that's all acting through the the hand puppet and it's very kind of emotional scene and there's a weight to the the puppet and the baby there's this, this you could tell that they, they they're weighty uh pieces of, of foam and whatnot and um a lot of times with cgi you don't you, you use that lose that weight they become kind of weightless uh, everything kind of you know kind of floats around right. whereas if you have those real pieces there uh that adds weight to it um and they seem more real uh whenever you and and you can't skip skip details they you know 
you, they have to look real uh, for it to, to come off good. Uh, but when it does, and this movie does it in spades, everywhere you look, I mean, even the there's the the big uh, big battle at the end of the movie uh, where they do a lot of um, uh, blue screen uh, instead of green screen. They did blue screen. I don't know what the difference is between the mm. two, uh, but it looks great. Whenever whenever it's done badly, you have those those lines around the actors, and you could tell that it's blue screen. In this, you can kind of tell it's blue screen, but uh, you don't you don't care because it looks cool. <laughs> uh, and there's yeah. like uh, all these rolling clouds, and they they filmed those clouds in Hawaii. They got those um, those <laughs> cloud <Okay. Very> cool. <laughs> cloud uh, yeah, and uh, it's it's a very cool scene. Um, this is sort of the beginning of those those big uh, set piece, big action scenes at the end of the movies where they all have to have this big action piece. If you've seen a Marvel superhero movie, you know what I'm talking about. The mm -hmm. whole big uh, drag out fight at the end that's over the top, right. uh, a bunch of noise. And a lot of times when I'm watching those in uh, Marvel movies, uh, my brain kind of turns off and I start get lost in the action because it, it becomes kind of meaningless to me. Mm. Whereas this movie, uh, it works because uh, they invested in the characters. You know all the motiva motivations between the characters, right? And um, even the dragon. You know why the dragon's fighting? It's 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 mad because you've killed its babies. Uh, there's motivations for every character. Um, there's not a character in this You're movie right that that, that right. that's that's just purely evil. Even the king, uh, even though he's kind of <laughs> a pompous and an asshole, and you don't like him. You know, you understand his motivations. Um, he's trying to protect his his daughter, his princess, right. um, and he's he's trying to protect the kingdom. He thinks he's doing what he thinks is right. Right. Everybody, even his 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 uh, top guards guy, uh, head of the 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 king's guard, he has his own motivations, and he's he wants to protect the kingdom as well. And how he protects the kingdom is very different from everybody else. And <laughs> um, you can still see see what he's how he works, and he's not like this pure evil guy. Um, so that in the end, that big battle, um, you don't get lost in the action because you understand the motivations for every character and why and what they're doing. And and, um, and you're you're invested with them. As you get to know the character, you, 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 you grow bonds with these these characters mm -hmm. in the story, and, and mm -hmm. the, uh, hallmark of a good story, <laughs> you know, pulls yeah. you in. Yeah, and um, the cool thing about Galen and Valerian, um, they're very similar, and but you know he's sort of kind of the um, in the traditional sense of a movie, he sometimes leans more towards the feminine side and she kind of leans mm -hmm. more towards the masculine. That's true. Um, she's, she's very forthright. And uh, he kind of uh, towards the end of the movie, he kind of, kind of backs off and kind of, you know, starts doubting himself and more of the, you know, needs to be protected kind of mode. And uh, that's a kind of interesting play. And <clears throat> Guillermo uh, points out um, during the, the final battle, there's a struggle. Um, he's instructed to destroy the necklace. And uh, uh, he kind of doesn't want to do it, and she wants to do it. And they almost become uh, one character, and you're physically seeing the struggle, um, that that internal struggle a, a single character would have over whether or not to destroy the necklace played out in real time with two different characters. And that that that's a very interesting idea. And, um, but, yeah, it plays out very well in this movie. And, and like I said... Um, you you could kind of get lost in the action of most movies, but the way it's choreographed, you understand what's going on. Yeah, in in some ways, the way that this movie was done is way more progressive and modern. Yeah. Than some of the some of the attempts, I'll call them attempts to mm -hmm. be polite, because um, we're not that kind of channel. Uh, but some of the <laughs> attempts that that try to do too many things at once. Um, mm -hmm which we've covered many, many, many times. Don't pick fights with the fans. You can do something very edgy and progressive and future thinking and forward thinking. That is all of, that is all of science fiction, uh, one, um, if, to name one genre that is near and dear to my heart. Um, but you, 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 you try to shove too many things in the box 
And, uh, you know, unlike a cat where it sits, it fits, uh, <laughs> you know, you, you're just going to have a, a crumpled up kind of flat two dimensional piece of, of art uh, that nobody has any affinity for uh, because there's no edge to it. There's no um, relief to it. There's no three dimensional aspect of it. Never mind the fourth dimensional aspect of the audience coming in and being being part of it just as much as as it, it goes on. Now, obviously, this is you, if you go to a play or a stand up or, or whatever, there's a little bit of an interaction between the audience and the and the, the the performer. Um, but with good movies like this, you get that you 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 are invited in and you can't help but get um, you know unless it's just isn't your thing or whatever. Yeah. But I mean, you should give it a chance. Um, and and uh, I uh, we're, we're we're a little over an hour, and that's fine. We can keep keep going. Um, but mm-hmm. there's just so many things to talk about, like for this, like good <laughs> yeah. f- special. And we always do this with like a really good movie. We always kind of tend to go over a little bit. We always kind right. of go like an, an extra 10 or 15 minutes, which is well deserved. Yeah. Um, and if anything, it just shows you like how much uh, appreciation that you can have for something like this. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and a cool thing, it, uh, speaking of uh, you, you mentioned it, Raiders of the Lost Ark, um, that beat out this movie for uh, visual effects and, and, mm-hmm. and, um, uh, and uh, oh, and we didn't even mention the score. Uh, Alex North, I believe, did the uh, did the mm-hmm. uh, the uh, the music score, which is no slouch on its own. Um, you know, uh, but the fact that it got uh, nominated for an Academy Award for uh, visual effects and best original score is remarkable. Um, that is uh, not fun, a, a quality crap fun, or a crappy movie. Fun fact uh, about Alex North: uh, Matthew Robbins talked about going to him, and oh yeah, I, I think um, I know he wanted him. More, more modernist. Um, he wanted a more modernist uh, soundtrack. Uh, he likes dissonant noise and whatnot. And I forget what uh, composer he mentions to the uh, to Alex North. And but Alex North go, yeah, that's my favorite guy too. And so they they instantly had a connection. Yep. But uh, fun, yeah. But fun fact, like I think you're <laughs> kind of nodding towards um, the Alex North did the. the um, uh, score for 2001: A Space Odyssey. I did not and, know that. Okay, yeah. Okay, and, I had two and, other ones for my notes, but yeah, yeah. Oh, go ahead, go and ahead. And then, and then, um, famously, Stan, Stanley Kubrick uh, ripped all of that out and put in, you know, these um, needle point, you know, drop point of uh, classical, uh, classical music scores mm. into it. Um, so Alex North had all this move, the music that he couldn't use. Uh, or wasn't out there, and so he reused a lot of it in this movie. Yeah, so cool. oh. uh, a lot of people, okay. a lot of people collect this soundtrack um, and have fun, kind of piecing together what, uh, where certain pieces would go into 2001: A Space Odyssey. Yeah. So if you're a big music guy and um, didn't know that, uh, yeah, pick up the score and uh, see what you can figure out on that. I, I think a lot of people have kind of placed out where the mu- music would have been and yeah. uh, how it plays out. But I'm, I'm not a huge music guy. I don't read music or anything. So yeah, but, um, that's, but, it's kind of lost on me, but I, it's fun to, fun to think about that. Right. <laughs> but but uh, all the same, uh, I, I, I am no music aficionado. I have no training, but I like what I like. And um, mm-hmm. uh, uh, movies... Just being a human, just being a person, um, uh, and you're no different than me. You've seen movies and you have been raptured or uh, enraptured by them, every aspect of them. Sometimes, and you want you go and and, and you that was Gladiator for me. Mm-hmm. Was like that's like my first brush with like paying attention to the soundtrack and how mm-hmm. much of a character it is in its own right. <laughs> um, and I believe that Alex North, all, he was a legend already by the mm-hmm. time that he came to this this movie. I believe he mm-hmm. did Spartacus and uh, Streetcar Named Desire as well. So, uh, mm-hmm. and the fact that he was tapped for uh, 2001 Space Odyssey is just icing on the cake. So that is mm-hmm. really cool. And uh, again, mm-hmm. it, it would be kind of funny if we had um, Rick and Morty's inter- interdimensional cable, you know, if we could kind of peek in on on another alternative mirror dimension or something or other or whatever and, mm-hmm. and, and, uh, and see what the world would have been like if this would have been a big hit, you know, if, 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 mm-hmm. if this go motion would have been maybe a little bit more updated in advance, even more advanced for like 1991, 1990, you know, three, whatever, whenever Jurassic Park came out, um, it would have been very interesting. Um, but yeah, this, this is what I love uh, about, uh, and this is where, where our channel 
flirts with the borderline cinematography a little bit. Um, mm-hmm. Obviously, uh, we do a very poor job. <laughs> we're, no, <laughs> we're no like film scholars or anything like that. And there's nothing. Mm-hmm. I'm not making fun. I, I, I actually, I, I, I love that. Um, and uh, different times in my life, I, I love to. I, well, I used to when it was on. I would, I would watch Turner Classic Movies, TMC for hours, you know, days, weeks. Um, mm-hmm. cause you don't know one, I'm young. I don't know anything when I was watching it. And two, you, you get exposure to like all these great history and trivia and, and movies that like are such a breath of fresh air. If you ever mm-hmm. want to take a break from modern drack or whatever mm-hmm. you want to call it, you know, whatever it is, you can always turn to these classics, these, these movies. And mm-hmm. I, to me, this is this goes beyond just being a cult classic to being a classic because of what it meant for the time and what came from what 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 it, what it was the prototype for. Um, and and I don't know about you, but like if you love films and cinema or you're a cinephile or whatever, um, and I don't claim that title at all. I think you are much better at that than I am. Um, and I think that's why people show up. And, I, and I'm I'm very grateful for that. I'm gr- very grateful to have your be the have the beneficiary of you being on the, on the show and getting to check out all these cool things because <laughs> I would have never come across this. Um, and mm-hmm. and just like I am discovering it, we want to share that with you, the viewer, uh, and, and we want you to to unwrap that that you know some sometimes we we cover a, <laughs> a, a <laughs> tongue in cheek cult classic that you know like babes and whatever mm-hmm. that one <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> you know silly ones like that yeah yeah um, usa up all night like which has its own mm-hmm. nostalgia and history yeah, with it babes, yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah exactly yeah, yeah. And, and there's yeah. others like this one like where they are truly foundational to cinema <laughs> you know mm-hmm. and um yeah i, I yeah. think like i said yeah it's, it's in that dna of um yeah it's found its place uh, yeah, and, and shout out to a couple of other people. Uh, the cinematographer Derek Van Lint, he um, sort of a classic cinematographer, and um, he was able to um, make use of the sets. Like, um, there's the scene where they're having the big lottery draw, and you know it looks like this huge place with all these people and um, waiting to find out who's which which woman's going to be picked. Um, it he used forced perspective. It's actually, it actually was kind of a tiny place and knowing, knowing that and seeing that scene uh, really impresses you. And also Elliot Scott, the production designer, uh, he, uh, um, you know, Matthew Robbins says he knew the money shots, you know, he, he knew that, you know, a lot of the scenes of, mm-hmm. since they were doing a widescreen movie, uh, a lot of the ceilings and whatnot weren't going to be seen. Mm-hmm. Um, so he had a lot of low, low ceilings. Um, so he knew how to dress the scene and, you know, you know, uh, do, you know, make sure the money shows <laughs> as the, as the saying goes. Uh, and that, that's, um, that, that it was kind of interesting because then, uh, you know, he was talking about, it, and then they would show clips of the scenes and then you could really see that with knowing um, this is one of those movies that you, know, you, you benefit from, seeing it over yep. a second time, a third time, a yep. fourth time. And he, they, they make a, what a, there's a couple other points I want to make uh, sure. before we wrap up. And uh, yeah, absolutely. Go ahead. Um, uh, Matthew Robbins, you can see his, his influences uh, like with the, the, the sorcerer, the wizard. Um, he's very much like Gandalf in the fact that, you know, he, he disappears through the first half of the, the movie, much like the books. Mm-hmm. And he, he reappears <laughs> Like Gandalf towards yeah. the end, all in white and his refineries. Right, right. Uh, but, <laughs> but unlike Gandalf and his, uh, Matthew Robbins's play on it, is he still kind of that that, that working man wizard? He's mm-hmm. that, that blue collar wizard with that smirk <laughs> and a and a joke, and you know, you immediately don't have that pomp and circumstance of of a character. You know, he's he's very much a real real guy. He's still still that with you know that, that like sassy that. wizard. Yeah, we're, <laughs> so, yeah. We're, we're gonna coin that blue collar wizard. Uh, that'll be on a t shirt <laughs> that we. Yeah, once we get our merch <laughs> our <eventually>. merchandise <laughs> store uh, set up for all that uh, silly stuff. Uh, when we're famous, mm-hmm. not really. Uh, like we'll, we'll we'll have to revisit that blue collar wizard. I like it. Blue collar wizard. Yep. And then, uh, uh, and also 
he was very much influenced by uh, Mickey Mouse in uh, Fantasia. You know, mm-hmm. he's the you know the <laughs> you know the wizard's apprentice in that, and um, which you know uh, Galleon is much like that that Mickey Mouse in that you know he's the apprentice and uh, you know he's kind of bumbling around and mm-hmm. um, yeah doesn't get everything right. And that's one of the things I love about the movie is that he's not truly, you know, he's not your traditional hero. Uh, he, he, he comes to terms with what, what he can do. And he realizes that he's not the, the big wizard that he thought he was. Right. And there's, um, human. he's human. Yeah. He's human. And he, he realizes his limitations right. and he, 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 uh, comes to peace with it and how the movie ends ends in you know the with everything right and is going to take credit for for everything and um you know <laughs> much like you know happens today and then you know they go off on their merry way to make uh, the world for themselves. It's um, uh, maybe maybe people wanted a more traditional um, sort of you know um, a hero story in this, and this this gives you something a little bit different. And no, maybe you have to be, right. uh, and maybe you have to be a little bit more mature and understand the world a little bit better uh, to truly appreciate this movie. I but I still think you could enjoy it as a as a kid because you know there's there's such a wonderful. <laughs> um, a wonderful thing about about this movie yeah and and there is something to to be said for that um you just don't find nowadays uh like where there yep. is sac- sacrifice um you know like where you you go to the very end um that there's um maybe there's a moral but we're, we're this is not this is not that kind of show um uh, but uh you should watch it all the way through and develop your own opinion and then if you get a chance See this on as big of a screen as you can, and the and the, mm-hmm. and the best possible quality that you can afford to get, <laughs> uh, yep. because you will be blown away, uh, in all the right ways. Um, that yep. um, that uh, like uh, like I said, I've, I've beat a dead horse here, but mm-hmm. um, th- this thing and, and and kind of going in with that that theme of learning and, and growing and whatnot. We here at the, at the Nerdum. We're, we are growing uh, as we go through this. And this is, what, I guess, would be our what, a start of our junior year, <laughs> I guess, yeah. since, since, since November. So uh, mm-hmm. we, we have a little bit more polish, a little bit more refinement. Maybe we're not all the way there, but um, we've grown by leaps and bounds. And your appreciation of seeing this movie will uh, be nothing but uh, good for you going forward because then you, you can see, like, where it started. Uh, where a certain concept started, and where they've been tr- they've been mimicked over and over again to poor quality, um, but once in a while, you get great ap- adaptations that are inspired by. Uh, now I'm gonna have to go do deep deep dive on like the uh, uh, Game of Thrones side of this, and you know really go into the the lore of the yeah. dragons. Yeah, you uh, could you could really see the influence. I mean, because uh, the the the. Um, the scenes in the uh, court or in the kingdom with the king and the kind of the, they touch upon a little bit of a political intrigue. Uh, there's kind of a back and forth with him and and um, and his his other people. And you don't normally see, you know, usually the bad guys are just stupid. Right, you know, right. um, there's uh, the king is very very smart. And in the scene where uh, you know Galleon's trying to impress the court with his his little <laughs> tricks that he does. Um, the the king very very fastly uh, clues in on the source of um, you know Galleon's uh, power and um, quickly uh, takes it and you know he's he's very smartly in what he does um, yeah there's there's sort of a intelligence to it and um, and yeah the darkness of this um, you know kind of the break from the traditional fantasy. Um, uh, I, I don't know if it influenced George R. R. Martin, but it was it has sort of the same DNA and and is well, you know a, kind of a cornerstone of of what um what would become Game of Thrones. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, maybe not the original author uh, George R. R. Martin, but like certainly the um, the practical or you know the 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 folks that made the dragons when they were shaping that and the and the HBO mm-hmm. side 
up yep. until it kind of fell off a cliff. But you know yep. what? <laughs> the other thing too, I wanted to I wanted to hammer home is you know not everything is perfect, and not everything has to be. So sometimes you can be disappointed, but kind of come back to something a little bit later, and mm-hmm. then appreciate some of the finer aspects of it if there are <laughs> any. <laughs> um, I, I know there's going to be a lot of people out there that are like, what are you talking about Game of Thrones? And like, you know, kind of, you know, it, it is what it is. But um, nonetheless, you know, anything with dragons or dragon related, uh, you know, dr- you know, dragon heart, that was, uh, th- that was iconic as well as reign of fire that too. I mean, it, I think it was a little bit more of a splash as I recall for making mm-hmm. a, a modern dragon movie, but it was still interesting and entertaining um, and kind of took chances that's another thing too that I think that we are sorely lacking and missing are the, the where's the risk? Where's the risk taking? Mm-hmm. Now, obviously, yeah. we're, we're not ever going to see mm-hmm. a PG movie again that has nudity and and kind of the level of gore yep. and, and things where uh, where yeah. it is. But um, all the same, this one holds yeah, up. Evidently, <laughs> evidently, with Peter Nichols, yeah, you, know, you see his bare ass when he jumps into the water. Uh, but evidently, I guess in 4K, you can see a little bit of his balls uh, between his legs as he jumps. I, I wasn't looking, but um, <laughs> so I was reading something, and they mentioned that. I was like, okay, uh, I'm not going to go back to, to, to find that. But, but evidently, right. <laughs> they, they had some male nudity in the movie uh, right. of a Disney movie. Uh, crazy. but uh, Disney but, home uh, video. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which uh, Paramount released the the 4K, so I guess Disney said, "Oh, you can handle that." Um, right. But uh, but yeah, one one last thing I want to point out: uh, the graphic artist uh, David Bunnett, um, Matthew Robbins, had him design the dragon. Um, mm. So that's his his design of the dragon. And Matthew said he used to kid David because uh, David had very much a a strong profile of his nose and everything. And okay. he, he kept saying that you could see a little bit of David in the, in the dragon. Okay. <laughs> so he kind of put himself a little bit. And back in the day, you know, we're used to pulling up, you know, uh, various um, programming stuff and being mm-hmm. able to pull any font you want out of the sky, you know, right. anything you, you're looking at, like our, our, our um, font is Brooklyn, right, uh, Brooklyn. from uh, the, the Pixlar, uh, Pixlar, uh, suite that I used to uh, design our thumbnails. Uh, but um, back in the day, there <laughs> you didn't have that, and you, you barely had computers. And so, and forget uh, the, <laughs> a font. You had one font on a computer at the, those days. So David Bennett or Bunnett designed that Dragon Slayer font, which has become kind of a big font. Um, uh, these days, but but yeah, it's it, it kind of when you see that font, you know Dragon Slayer. I mean, it, it, it screams That's Dragon true. Slayer, and um, yeah, I was tempted to use that on our thumbnail, but I wanted but, to keep it our our own <laughs> our own style. The, but uh, but yeah, it's very distinctive. Yeah, that's just like um, back in the day, Joust, um, the the famous arcade game mm-hmm. um, that has like that, that. In my mind's eye, I can see that kind of unique or Nintendo or you know like uh, mm-hmm. yeah, Star yeah, Trek. Yeah, they all or, had their. Their font, yeah, you had to make yep. your, yeah, yeah, kind of a name brand, and uh, yeah, so it kind of name brand the, this movie as well. So yeah. that's that, that was kind of kind of neat. Uh, I, it's something I I didn't think about, but but mm. just kind of bl- plain there in 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 your face. Yeah, <laughs> and, you and, see and it. there's a level of 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 detail and care that comes with films that you can tell. Like uh, I remember, like um, back in the early two thousands and whatever, there was like a big grind against piracy, and and mm-hmm. they they even had like when you went to the theater, they had like commercials and stuff about the MPAA, and and if you pirate a movie, you're you're stealing dinner from mm-hmm. the cast and the crew, and uh, and and some of that is a little bit true. Um, <laughs> you wouldn't steal a car, would you? <laughs> <laughs> right, right. You wouldn't. You wouldn't steal. A car. You wouldn't download a car, would you? You wouldn't. Well, it, but anyway, but, you wouldn't but shoot a baby, would right, you? <laughs> right. And obviously, that's propaganda for for you know. D- don't st- right. pay for your pay for your sh- your shit, mm. and what and that's whatever. Nobody really has a gripe really about it. Well, they didn't back then, but nowadays mm. it, it's it's uh, it, all's fair in love and war, baby. That's all I'm gonna say. But mm-hmm. I will say this. Um, it is true uh, when movies are well made like this, you can see that every single grip, every single staffer, every single, even the lowest level dude or or gal who was on this movie, they earned their money. They earned their money and they put their heart and, and sold that all the way up to the top, all the way up to to uh, to the director. 
Uh, and that is, a, the, again, um, you may not like Avatar, but James Cameron is like one of those types like where he, he doesn't mess around. He will, he will scrap an entire month of, of filming if it doesn't meet his standard. You know, and obviously that's a little bit extreme example, but the same can be said for any good movie, you know, like that's why they do it again or whatever. And then you have an actor, you have that, that tension between the actor and the, and the director if it's really well made and, and good or whatever, whatever it is. Like you have good tension and the product of that is uh, what you can enjoy. Um, so how they always make that out, it's not, you know, George Lucas in the prequel or, or the, you know, the prequel trilogy who is basically doing whatever the hell he wants. There is no no. There is no limitation. And I'm not saying they're good or they're bad or whatever. Like I have my own opinion on them. But, you know, George Lucas, whether he was constrained by budget or practical or, or, or physics or whatever it is, um, that's like when you're on the edge and you and you you you're on that bleeding edge and you get the maximum amount out of, out of it. This movie is no different, um, and and you can see that with Trailblazers like this. And I and, and I I can't wait, I can't wait till our next movie that we go to that is like this. You know that that I I had no clue about. Maybe you didn't <laughs> yeah. have a clue about. Um, well, I I knew I knew about it and I'd well, right, seen it because right, because right. I I didn't know if I had um, I don't know if I've seen it the whole thing through, but I. Uh, certain certain moments in the movie was like, oh yeah, I remember You've that. It, so right, I must right, have, I must have seen it, but it didn't have the impact that it did today, and I wasn't, right. uh, you know, I, I wasn't ready for the movie, <laughs> so to speak. I guess. No, I, um, I can I, I I I feel that I feel that very much because um, there are properties like whether the the books or or movies that I will revisit. I'm just not I'm not feeling it. I'm not mature enough. I'm not whatever enough. And then you come to it when the time is right, mm -hmm. and boy, the time is right for this. So go out and see, go yep. see this movie. <laughs> Preferably, again, I would say this, go see it with the highest quality that you can afford to, um, and you won't be disappointed. Mm -hmm. you, you'll find some aspect that will become endearing to you, mm -hmm. um, which is every other 80s movie that you know, kiddos or folks that grew up that were born in the 70s or 80s you know, found, you know, even 60s, sure. Um, you know, if yeah, and I, I think the I think the 4K is still on um, Amazon for like 20 bucks. That's where I got it. So. So, yeah, right. um, <laughs> relatively cheap. Uh, you know, our love for Amazon. So you can probably find yeah. it on Walmart or Best Buy or any. Uh, any uh, yeah. And I want to well. I, I want to clarify that, too, like with the whole Amazon thing. Like, this doesn't mean I'm not ever going to or you or, J uh, you know, or right. Jay. Uh, yeah. It doesn't mean that we're never going to shop on Amazon again. It's mm -hmm. just that, like, it's just not going to be the default convenient yeah, it's, option. It's not the, the go-to, the go-to anymore. It's, um, it's an op option, um, uh, between right. uh, many different options. Um, like, uh, which we may, may talk about it, uh, at a future thing. I got, um, the, uh, inside the mind of, uh, and Joe, Cop and Joe right <laughs> which, um, okay, uh, great stuff. We may talk about that, uh, later on, but I got that from Walmart. Walmart got that for me. Um, no shit. Wow. But uh, but yeah, it, it got tied up in uh, Kentucky because of the weather. But uh, it, it took a little bit longer to get. Oh, man. Uh, but well, yeah, it was yeah. it was a yeah it was a great price. And actually, if I had shopped around a little bit, I found it a little bit cheaper on Barnes and Noble's um, website. Uh, a little bit cheaper. So um, yeah, always always do your due diligence. Uh, shop for the best price. And that was Arrow Films that put that out. And as a last note um, that I wanted to maybe tie a little bow on this um, and to uh, say that, you know, if everything's going right, sometimes it just doesn't work out. Um, you know, the you know, Empire Strikes Back came out. It's a huge hit. Uh, they did a big premiere of this movie. And uh, <laughs> Matthew Robbins, the co-writer and director, sat right next to George Lucas as they watched the movie for the first time on the big screen. And after the movie, uh, George turned to uh, Matthew and said, man, you've got a hit on your hands. <laughs> and Matthew was like, yes. You know, <laughs> you know, at that time, George Lucas had the Midas touch, you know, whatever he touched mm -hmm. was gold. 
this is going to be a huge hit. And then <laughs> it, it tanked. And then uh, a few months later, Raiders Lost Ark came out. It was a huge hit. And right. Matthew was like, what happened? <laughs> you know, yeah, <laughs> you know what happened? Yeah. Uh, just, just, just turns out that way sometimes. But he also, uh, Matthew Robbins has had um, a very cool um, uh, career. Uh, he actually did a lot of commercials with ILM. Um, they they did a lot of commercial work, uh, and he did a lot of commercials. He still writes movies. Like I said, he uh, co-wrote a, a number of scripts with Guillermo del Toro, and I really want to do Crimson Peak at a future date. So um, and he co-wrote that with Guillermo. So hopefully uh, we can. Uh, oh, we will. And uh, and um, now that like and the beautiful thing about when I'm introduced to these things like a Giallo's or whatever, I, I mm-hmm. start to kind of reach reach branch out and, and be like, hey. Let's let's check out that 1964 one, the the, the you <laughs> yeah. know whatever. But um, but um, but uh, Thomas brings up a great point. You're never gonna know unless you subscribe. So we we mm-hmm. sincerely do thank you if you made it this far, um, or or you you joined us somewhere along our back catalog. We we welcome you with open arms, and mm-hmm. we hope that you stay with us for m- more great content. Um, you know, it's just two dudes um, that have appreciation for what we love. Uh, we mm-hmm. are definitely nerds, um, in, mm-hmm. in, in the good sense of, I, well, I don't think there's really a bad sense anymore for, nerd. Mm-hmm. I think that's been busted, uh, cause, uh, yeah. <laughs> nerds make money. Uh, well, <laughs> some of us do, but, uh, well, if you're Elon or you're, uh, or, uh, uh, what's his face, uh, uh, Ellison from, uh, you know, Oracle or whatever, you know, or, or whatever, but mm-hmm. anyway, but, uh, all that joking aside, um, f- you can, yeah, f- yeah, this, this channel is really, um given me a, a deeper appreciation for uh movies and yep, as, if you've if you watched along with us we've started finding the connective tissue between movies like tron and this movie and yep. you know other movies yep. you once you start looking 100%. at the behind the scenes of it um you see this this whole different uh world that uh film world that and see it in a different way. Um, so yeah, hopefully uh, you're getting a lot out of it, like us. Like uh, I always thought I was a big movie guy, but um, now that I'm kind of being more critical as we watch and we do a little bit more research into the movies, you get a. I think I've gotten a, a deeper appreciation for the movies that I love, and hopefully I've been able to share that with you and you, Mike, and the audience. <laughs> oh, absolutely. No, no. I, I again. Um... The audience, when we you know we we get to a certain size, they're they're going to have their own opinion, obviously, um, mm-hmm. and and <laughs> it's going to be what it is. Um, right. And, right and, and to be honest with you, like you know, if if it's constructive criticism, we if it's terrible, we don't really care. We, we, mm-hmm. we welcome we welcome all. Maybe you maybe you watched this as a kid, you hated it. Tell us why. Like maybe there's an aspect mm-hmm. there that we missed. Um, there uh, us trying to be, but we mm-hmm. we we try to keep it lighthearted. We we try to find the things. And, and as I say, I, I like to say it's not so much that we review things; it's it's more about being a recommendation engine for mm-hmm. other people out there who want to just see something good. Um, you know that there there should be more of that in the world. But if you've made it this far, we sincerely appreciate it. And go ahead. And while we're getting numbers on YouTube, which is a a, a nice thing to have, um, at some point when we hit five hundred subscribers, we can maybe have a community around us and, and we can, we can have a little bit more live interaction. That is our goal. Um, we are in our junior year, so to speak, if this were college, <laughs> we would be uh, more than halfway done toward our degree <laughs> as it were. <laughs> um, but this is the real world. And we bring to you what we, what we find week after week. We don't really have a big overall arching plan. Maybe one day that'll be a <laughs> thing. That'll be, boy, how great would that be Thomas to wake up in the morning and, and have to do this as a job. That would be great. Um, <laughs> Maybe yeah. it'll happen. Maybe probably not, but that's okay. But uh, mm-hmm. all things being equal, go to Twitter and follow Thomas's account, uh, our official account on Twitter. Um, mm-hmm. If you if you want to have some interaction or whatever, um, Thomas does a great job. I, I <laughs> you you are more than welcome to take that because uh, <laughs> you know I have a very love hate relationship with social media, and I mm-hmm. tend to disappear from time to time because I just don't care. Uh, or I, it's not that I don't care. It's just that I want, I, I, I live you get in the, the real band world. hammer. <laughs> you well, get the band hammer. <laughs> I do get the band hammer a lot. I do, and, and that is what it is, but you know, um, I, whatever, but in any case, uh, definitely on YouTube. And, uh, like I said, um, I'm going to make a very hard push. 
Um, this week, like I promised the audience time after time, um, to look at the, uh, the, the website and get it revamped, um, get it going, maybe even do a little bit more as we go on and, and, and learn a little bit more. Um, but you can find us on Twitter um, uh, at, uh, at Thomas's account. And I'll, of course, as always, uh, YouTube, w- which is our, our, our home base here, uh, we thank you so much for joining us and, and, yep. and doing this little thing called the video and content and all that wonderful things. And uh, it, j- stay tuned because we have a very special what's, uh, what's the deal uh, from our special guest with me and Thomas from from Jay from last week, which I neglected to upload on Wednesday, <laughs> if I'm honest. Yep. Um, but we're human and we have day jobs, so that's all good. Mm-hmm. Uh, but look look forward to that. Um, that'll be a special thing, uh, and we will uh, we'll go from there. And I don't. I, the only thing I could say is is one thing that I love about these kind of things, and we've talked talked about it in books and whatnot is. If you can get inspired, um, not necessarily to create, but like you, you just kind of get in the mode like where you want to see fantasy or something, mm-hmm. um, you're going to be very well served to start with this as your base, and then kind of mm-hmm. build out from it, like from from there, like mm-hmm. all your favorite, you know, dragon mm-hmm. movies. And and while that, this is a challenge to the audience. Um, tell us what if you started with this movie, what would be your second pick? your third pick, your fourth pick, uh, what would you end with? What would it be 10 films? Would it be five? Would it be four? Would it be a book? What, you know, tell us, uh, the imagination runs wild. Uh, and in the famous words of LeVar uh, Burton, you don't have to take my word for it or Thomas's word. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And the, the fun thing with, <laughs> with our, with our, uh, website rec- or a YouTube channel recently, mm-hmm. Used to, you'd hit the refresh button and our uh, subscribers would stay the same. But lately, I've been hitting it and um, that, that it's been changing. So uh, you never know um, Yo, we'll, what we'll, fun will be. Yeah, <laughs> We'll see if this one comes in. Well, well still 142, oh, oh, yeah. but well, that's okay. That's okay. That's okay. That's okay. Yeah. Uh, it's, we it's can't expect good. too much. But, <laughs> yeah, but, we're, but... We're, <laughs> yeah, we're not playing with everything. So, yeah. Uh, it's all reality. Um, Absolutely. And then uh, one, uh, one last fun fact. Um our last uh, fantasy movie we talked about was Lady Hawk, and mm. both that movie and this movie ended with an eclipse. And tonight, the cl- no, no, actually, we don't have an eclipse tonight, but <laughs> that would have been cool. <laughs> but you know what? If you use your mind's eye, you can see it. Yeah. You can see it. Yep. Um, but with that being said, I've been Mike. And I'm Tom. And we'll see you next week. And remember, we don't do tests. No tests. No test. Dragon Slayer, 1981. Slaying the discussion with Tom and Mike on the first, the last, the nerdum. We're out! 170. Are you afraid of dragons?